Good evening, everyone. This is Patrick Stewart saying welcome to The Graham Norton Show. We've got some great guests for you tonight, I tell you. That sofa will be hotter than a special place in hell. <laughs> Legs, uh, gloves coming off, aren't they? <gasps> there he is, EU Council President Donald Tusk. Caused outrage, outrage, I'd say, uh, when he wondered what the special place in hell would look like for people who promoted Brexit without a plan. Well, since you asked Donald, I think it might look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of offensive foreign politicians called Donald, yes, uh, <laughs> Trump finally made his State of the Union speech this week. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't riveting, but uh, here was the audience. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Completely out of it. That's Melania. <laughs> uh, at one point, though, there were whoops and applause from the Democratic Congresswomen. Uh, there they are, all dressed in white. Ah. Now, poor Donald, he thought they were applauding him, when really he should know that when a woman dresses in white it is, in fact, code for I hate Trump. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good news, though, for Trump fans. Uh, it was announced he'll be making a second visit to Britain in December. Oh, <gasps> what a lovely Christmas treat. <laughs> uh, the royal family will once again be involved. In fact, the Queen has already organised a driver to pick Trump up from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> He's the BAFTA Emmy and Golden Globe winning star of The Office, Extras and Derek. He's here to tell us about his new sitcom, Afterlife. Always a pleasure to welcome Mr. Ricky Gervais! There he is! Oh, I'm gonna go... Uh, yeah, do that, do that, yeah. Seize the moment. Ricky Gervais! He's the British star of films like Love Actually, Kinky Boots and Doctor Strange and was Oscar nominated for 12 Years a Slave. Now he brings us the inspiring true story of the boy who harnessed the wind. Please welcome Tuatel Ejiofor! <laughs> Hello! 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 Come in, come in, come in. Tuatel Ricky! <laughs> this Golden Globe winning actress has starred in films like Boys in the Hood, Jerry Maguire and Enemy of the State. Now she's Oscar nominated for her role in If Beale Street Could Talk. Welcome for the very first time, Regina King! <laughs> You look like a prize. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, darling. Come in, come in, sit down. Hello. And this star of stage and screen rose to fame in Star Trek and went on to worldwide movie success with the X-Men franchise. Now is in the fantasy epic, The Kid Who Would Be King. Welcome back, Sir Patrick Stewart! <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Welcome all... Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see a fist bump very often on the couch. Nice, nice to see it. Uh, to tell, uh, mm. we've chatted before, we have never been on the show before, and Regina, we just met. Is, Hello, yes. welcome. Hello. And this is such an exciting time in your life, Regina King, because uh, you're on one of those roles. You're nominated for every award going, nominated for the Oscar, and you're, you're winning, you're doing, yeah. It's, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Winning feels good. Yeah. But now, you guys, uh, Ricky and Patrick, you obviously know each other. You work together on extras. And, yeah, yeah. 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 Now, is it true that you, you didn't think it was Ricky trying to contact you? It is true, yeah. Um, I had a friend who was very good at doing impersonations, voices. And I was in my local supermarket down in Bermondsey, you know, keeping it real. <laughs> <laughs> Collecting your club points. <laughs> exactly. And my phone rang and uh, I said, yeah, hello. And uh, this voice said, oh, Patrick, it's Ricky. It, it, Ricky. And I said, Ricky? Ricky's raised. Yeah. Uh, listen, we're doing this show, new show, and maybe you've heard of it. And he pitched extras. 
to me. And he convinced me that I was not speaking to my friend, the impersonator. Yeah, yeah. It really was Ricky Gervais. Now, I've never asked you this, Ricky, but was that the customary way with which you approached actor? Yeah, every time I asked every person personally to, to be in it. And, and did uh, you make sure they were in the supermarket? No, I didn't know. <laughs> I thought you were in a play at the time. No, I sir, thought... I was in the Bermondsey supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. It's still the record um, for extras for the most takes. Two grown men just giggling. <laughs> just giggling every time he said knickers or something. <laughs> it was just... How many takes? Uh, I think it was about 45, but it was just... <laughs> It was, and it just got worse. And then you see the crew sort of not laughing anymore. And then it, I just couldn't do it. It was such a silly scene. It's him pitching me an idea. So we've got the clip. Um, well, we watch, okay. should yeah, watch the clip. Yeah, Here's sure. a reminder. Here's a reminder of the scene. In my film, I play a man who controls the world with his mind. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, for instance, um, I'm walking along and um, I see this beautiful girl and I think I'd like to see her naked and so all her clothes fall off. All her clothes fall off. Mm, yes, and she's scrabbling around to get them back on again, but even before she can get her knickers on, I've seen everything. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it all. Okay. It's a comedy, is it? No. <laughs> it's about what would happen, you know, if these things were possible. What's the story, though? What's the. Well, uh, I do other stuff. Like, I'm riding my bike in the park, and this policewoman says, Oi, you can't ride your bike on the grass, and I go. Oh, no. And her uniform falls off. And she's like, ah! And she's trying to cover up, but I've seen everything. Anyway, I get on my bike, I ride off. On the grass. <laughs> it's very good. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, right, lots of good stuff to talk about tonight. Uh, let's start with Regina King. This is your time. You're Oscar nominated for the role of Sharon Rivers in If Beale Street Could Talk, which is out now. And uh, this is the latest from Barry Jenkins, who obviously uh, won the Oscar eventually for Moonlight. Eventually. Yeah. Um, but now, so it's a James Baldwin novel. So uh, tell us about it. Who are you? What's the story? It's a love story about these, this young couple, uh, Tish and Fani. Tish is my daughter, and Fani is accused of. Um, raping someone, a crime he didn't commit. And you see this family, how they get through it. And it's, al although it's a love story around the two of them, you get to see the love between um, a husband and wife, a father and daughter, uh, two uh, friends, uh, the father and one of his friends. So it's a universal love story. But, um, it's quite beautiful. It's lyrical. Yeah, because I was—we were saying about that. one of those stories that you know, even as you describe it now, people are thinking like, like, oh, I don't really see depressing that. and bleak. Yeah. No. But it's—it's it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it, you've seen it, haven't you? Patrick? I have. Yeah, it's wonderful. No, it, really, it is. It's the, the way some, something about the way it's shot. I don't know what it is. The way the camera moves. Yeah. The way he just kind of sits there makes you. Um, the, it brings the audience in. And sometimes I've had people come and they say, "I was just so uncomfortable. I felt like I was invading on someone's." a private space, but I couldn't look away, Yeah, you know? Well, we've got a, a clip from one of those sorts of scenes. Okay. Uh, this is you confronting the, the family of your pregnant daughter's boyfriend. Yes. Yes. That child is coming. It's your grandchild. I don't understand you. It's your grandchild. What difference does it make how he gets here? The child ain't got nothing to do with that. Ain't none of us got nothing to do with that. That child. That child. That child. That child. That child. Get your shit. Take your shit with you. Whoa. You know what? That was the only ad lib in the entire movie. The get your shit. <laughs> <laughs> because the first take that we did, they forgot their coats. So, as most of you guys know, <laughs> you keep going until they say action. So, Barry didn't say action. So, I said, get your shit. <laughs> yeah, I don't want, so, your, yeah, I don't want yeah. your coats in here. Yeah, get them so out. I'm proud to have the only ad lib. <laughs> It's a small thing. And you based it on kind of matriarchs in your own family, your mom, your grandmother. Yes, my mom, my, my grandmother, they're both 
uh, those women that in their communities, my grandmother, um, when she was alive in her church, was always the woman that people felt that she nurtured them. You know, she had several kids, several um, people that um, just wanted Loretta to love on them because they knew that if she had her, gave them her, her approval or um, just blessed them with a conversation, you just would feel better. And Sharon read like that to me when I read the script and yeah. when I read the book. So I just uh, tapped into those two beautiful women. And uh, one of those beautiful women, your mother, she's got the plus one for the Oscars. Oh, yes, mm. absolutely. First time, of course, Mom is going. To... And you've just done that lunch, that nominee's lunch. The Oscar nominee luncheon. Is you... there a lunch? Do you eat? Yes, you do. Okay. Yes, you do. And the dessert was delicious. It was the best part of the lunch. <laughs> but it, it's, um, it's actually a really wonderful um, event because they're smart to put only one actor at the table. So they have people from each category. You, he's been at the lunch. Yeah, so. Well, no, I, actually, I missed the lunch. <gasps> Why oh. did you miss the lunch? I missed the lunch. I was, I was, I was working, yeah, so I missed the, like, the most fun bit. I've never missed a lunch. <laughs> 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 We've got the picture. They take a picture whenever they do this. They take yes. a huge picture of you all. Well, uh, you can't even find me, I'm sure. Oh, I did earlier. There you are. Yes. Just over there. And I always thought it was just a bun fight to find a place to stand, but they, apparently they tell you where to stand. They tell you where to stand, and, you know, you, you stand for the introduction of every person, so we're there clapping. But you've, you've been... No, ma'am. Oh, no. OK. Awkward. <laughs> Oh, she knows I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, didn't even look at no, you. Actually. Didn't bother. <laughs> no, yeah. no. There was a chance here, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now, but the thing is, after the Golden Globes, you were talking about you on. You've been on shows like this, talking about how you've got this mad crush on Sam Elliott. I do. And but now he knows. So he does. there he is. He's been placed quite far away from you. <laughs> <laughs> They made sure I wouldn't accost him at the <laughs> luncheon. Does he acknowledge that he knows that you... Yeah, have... of course he does. He's a lovely man, yes. OK. Yeah. So is it wasn't it, awkward? Is it the voice? Is it's the... the everything. All right, OK. It's the everything. It's the moustache. It's the voice. He's got that gravelly... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. Because, but, but as you mentioned, Chiwetel, you had this whole experience too, the whole... Yeah, not... apart from the lunch, everything else. Yeah, you missed the lunch. I missed the lunch. But is it fun or is it just... It's, um, I mean, it's... It's exhausting. It's exhausting, yeah. Uh, it can be fun. It has yeah. definite highlights, yes. you know. Um, I remember being at the after party. The after parties at the Oscars, win or lose, yeah, I mean, they're great. They're, they're the best. You know, I was at the... I, was, I took my mum to the whole thing as well and... Uh, I remember being at the after party and looking just... It was a... Madonna had a party. Oh, yes. And, uh, and I looked over um, at one point and I just saw my mum in a very deep conversation with John Travolta. Wow. And I thought, that's probably the most surreal thing <laughs> I've ever seen. And I wonder what they're talking about. They're very intense, you know. But I, and I never really got to the bottom of what they were talking about, but, you know. Yeah. That is weird. <laughs> that is, that is yeah. yeah, that's weird. Yeah. But now, of course, Ricky, you famously became friends with your kind of musical hero through extras. Oh, David Bowie. Yeah. Yeah, he was my hero for oh. music for about 25 years. And, um, yeah, then I, I met him and uh, uh, I invited him to do extras. And uh, he said yes. Um, uh, just incredible. Oh. Um, I co-wrote a song with him, the, the, so the song that we sing in extras. And I, um, I sent him the lyrics and I called him up. And I said, Do you get the lyrics? He went, yeah. I said, um, yeah. I said, I said, can you give me some um, sort of, like, retro, like, uh, Life on Mars? And he went, yeah, I'll just knock off a quick fucking Life on Mars for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do oh, that. Oh, it was amazing. Wow. It was amazing. To the end, just incredible. An artist to the end and kept putting out material right to the end. It was incredible. Yeah. And did you just get in touch because of extras, or you were friends anyway? No. Um, well, the first time I met him, I was sort of newly famous, and I was invited to um, one of those things at the BBC. Uh, like, uh, the office had just come out, I think, on DVD the first year, 
and uh, I was invited by um, Greg Dyke, who was the director general then, and um, we went to watch David Bowie, with a few other people, and then after, Greg Dyke came up to me and said, oh, you're a big Bowie fan, aren't you? I said, yeah, I love him. He said, come and meet him. Right, and I went, really? Yeah, come on, come and meet him. Right, come on, right? And uh, there was me and Jane and Greg Dyke walking to meet David Bowie, and on the way he went, Salmon, Salmon Rushdie joined us. Um, <laughs> uh, we went and met da David Bowie, and he was very polite. He didn't know who I was. Um, I remember the next day, I was in the pub with my mate, and he said, what did you do last night? And I went, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, I said, um, and then I got an email from David Bowie saying, um, so I watched The Office, what do I do now? And we sort of became pen pals, I invited the directors. Then he um, invited me to um, play a, a benefit in New York, my first New York gig, at Madison Square Garden, and he introduced me. And the crowd didn't know he was going to be there, and they went crazy. And he just came out with a harmonica and went, chubby little loser, <laughs> and just sang, <laughs> sang the song. And it was, it was amazing. And that was his last live appearance. Oh, wow. my God. Yeah, I didn't know that. yeah, incredible. That's extraordinary. Yeah. Extraordinary, yeah. Amazing. Wow. Uh, now, Sir Patrick Stewart brings us The Kid Who Would Be King. Now, this opens next Friday, the 15th of February. Uh, it's kind of a new take on the King Arthur story, really. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, uh, the, the, the nation is in trouble. It's, well, <laughs> tell me about Hello. it. Hello. <laughs> it's a documentary. Don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a documentary. <laughs> and uh, uh, a young Merlin arrives uh, unclothed on, <laughs> on the set. <laughs> This is not me. <laughs> you, you don't see, you don't see, don't see everything. You don't see everything. <laughs> and, uh, and they they have come down to um, uh, a, a residential area somewhere in South London, and there are these four kids, and they all go to this local comprehensive. And um, this y young man tells them that they have been chosen. Um, one of them is chosen because he is King Arthur if he can pull the sword from the stone. And there's Sir Bedivere and there's Lancelot and so forth. And you, sir, uh, you finally get to play a wizard. At last. You know, <laughs> it, it had been bothering me for a long time. You know, there, there's Michael Gambon, who's, who's a friend, and, and there's Ian McKellen, who was with us, of course, last time. Yes. Who's a good friend. And they're playing these wonderful roles of wizards. And I, I mean, look at me. I mean, I, <laughs> did you ever see a better object? You scream <laughs> wizard. Thank, thank you. Yes. And then, also, you share the role. There you... That's you as Murray. With Angus Imrie. And then Angus Imrie, he's the young... Mer but you're he's both... the young... Because Mer Merlin was living backwards. Of course. In, in the legend. And uh, so we see both of them. We see the young one and the uh, somewhat aged one. No, no, the matured one. <laughs> thank you, matured. Yes, that's the, the matured one. Word. Yeah, mm, ripe. We've got a, a, a clip. This is basically just kind of a, 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 a taster of what the film's like. A true king is brave and noble. You must choose what you stand for. What if it's the sword in the stone? <laughs> I am Merlin. I thought Merlin was supposed to be an old man. An ingenious disguise, don't you think? You will make excellent knights of the round table. Who will swear allegiance? <laughs> An evil army will rise from the dead, and you must stop them. You're a king, Alexander. We need to raise an army. Who will join us? This is instead of lessons today. Yeah! You have been chosen to save your kingdom. Where did you know how to drive? Mario Kart. Christmas Day. That was exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kid, uh, the Wood King. That's out uh, on the fifteenth. Uh, now, recently, you have been talking though about uh, the Jean Luc Picard. He's coming back. Is this right? <laughs> that. <gasps> so I, did... I know. <laughs> yeah. So is it, where is he going back? Is it going on, on telly? On, where is he coming back to? Yeah, is it, is, uh, is, it a, is it a movie? Is it a... <laughs> yeah, he's doing his shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, uh, I, I still can't quite fully take it on board uh, because I'm not only reviving Jean-Luc Picard, but I'm also co-executive producer. On Hello. It, which okay. I've, mm. I've never done before. I, it, and it's, it's, it sounds quite easy. 
Well, it's got the word executive and co, so, you know. <laughs> no. No, there's gonna be a, a... And you're the famous one, so the other one can do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are, there are several of us. Yeah, we are, we are reviving... <laughs> we're reviving a Picard story. Um, it's exactly 19 years in the future, which was how time has passed since the last time I put on my spacesuit. Um, has it really been that long? 19. It has been, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. I mean, for the television series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I heard you talking in an interview about when you went for when you were I think it was after you were cast They had quite a different vision of Jean-Luc Picard that he wasn't going to be the way he turned out to be Well, yeah, they they thought he should be French For one thing <laughs> and did you do it French? Um, I did a recording a taping which must be somewhere in the vaults of <laughs> Paramount Pictures um, Where we experimented with the French accent. Would you like to hear a sample of it? Oh, yes, go on. Yes. 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 Okay. Spiss. <laughs> <laughs> the final frontier. <laughs> These are the voyage <laughs> of the starship Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't use it. <laughs> it's very good. Uh, right, True Dark Legend 4, you are bringing us The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, and it's in selected cinemas from February the 22nd, streams on Netflix from March the 1st, and, and now this is you. <laughs> this is, you're in it, you wrote the screenplay, you directed it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been an extraordinary experience. You know, I read the book about uh, 10 years ago, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, the story of um, William Kamkwamba, who was um, experienced when he was about 13 in 2001, 2002, was experiencing with his family and community a famine in Malawi. And, you know, a famine hit that community in that area of Malawi. And, um, and he was taken out of school because <clears throat> school in, in secondary school isn't free in Malawi. So his family took him out of school and they all sort of knuckled down preparing for, for the worst as this, as this event sort of arrived. And, um, and he started sneaking into the school and he found a textbook um, called Using Energy. And on the front of it was a wind turbine, like a windmill. And so going into the <clears throat> local junkyards, you know, started picking up sort of scraps of metal and stuff and started to put together a windmill in order to generate electricity to hopefully um, irrigate the land through a water pump. So I was so inspired by his story and it's so full of hope and, you know, um, beauty, and it's an incredible tale. And so I, I decided to um, adapt it and direct it and be in it and go to Malawi and shoot it and, you know... And at what stage do you then decide to complicate things more? Because you, a lot of the movie is in a, a very specific local dialect. It's in Chichiwa, the language of, of, of Malawi, which is about... About half the film is uh, in, in, in Chichiwa, um, which was a decision that I kind of took quite early in the process because I wanted it to feel like a really authentic experience for the audience, to sort of just sort of have this sort of teleportation into this, into this space, into this beautiful place. And, um, but it did require me learning Chichiwa and several members of the of the cast. Well, he knows French, Chichua. so he could probably. Yeah, so we could. Uh, <laughs> yes. We could do a French to chew a version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, nice, you didn't yeah. think of me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before we see the clip, we must just talk about the the boy who plays uh, the, the boy who harnessed the wind, yeah. Maxwell, uh, who plays William. Yeah. Because uh, he is. I He's mean, a extraordinary. phenomenal, phenomenal actor. You know, he was able to do very little and communicate all of these different emotions, and it took me personally years before I was able to kind of, you know, understand film acting and sort of being slightly more minimal. Um, and uh, he just sort of had it instinctively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a wonderful actor. Well, this is a clip. Uh, this is you uh, preparing him uh, for his first day at school. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> 
Peter Cusco. And did you, I mean, did you just learn what you had to say phonetically, or did, did you actually learn how to speak? Though? Well, I started learning uh, the language, you know, uh, and then when we got to Malawi, I just sort of knuckled down and to the actual, what I was going to say. Uh, we had a great translator in the UK, Sanson Kambula, who, was, uh, who did all the translations here. And then there were a couple of people in Malawi as well that I was working with and the rest of the cast were working with, including Maxwell, who also doesn't speak Chichua. Uh, and so he was learning Chichua as well. And English isn't his first language either, so it That's, was... It was right, it my was first film, funny. right, was uh, an American movie. Right, and I was meant to be an American, and I said, "Put a line in." He's from Reading. <laughs> and and I just did my own accent. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> On top of acting, right, and directing, it's, and yeah, writing. Yeah, I know. I feel like I'm yeah. achieving. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm blown away. You I must be. You must Maybe be... it's not a real language. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he was just staying and, th and then put subtitles. <laughs> up. <laughs> who's gonna Who's gonna know? <laughs> yeah. I'm not I'm learning all of this. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all of this nonsense. Right. Rubbish. <laughs> People from Malawi going, what the fuck is this? This doesn't air in uh, Malawi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 the only place yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. There's no <laughs> premiere in Malawi. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. He learned the language <laughs> just for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, while you're here, we must also mention a big uh, movie event this year, the live-action Lion King, which you are in. Oh, yeah. And not just in, you're Scar. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now, the word on the street, but I don't know, is that Scar doesn't sing in this, or he does sing in this? I mean, I... You play Scar, right? Oh, uh, that's true, yeah. yeah. Do you remember singing at any point? <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. Well, it's like news night, this, isn't it? Any it's incredible. Aspect, any aspect, yeah. Of it. yeah. How did they do live action and you're playing a lion? How is it live action? Like, you're playing a lion. Is it CGI on top of uh, acting, or is it... It's not just you with a lion wig on. <laughs> I don't know. It was that moment. It was that moment. No, there and was. And I, I had to learn lion. <laughs> <laughs> A series of growls. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we know you can sing because, of course, we heard you singing as Lola in Kinky Boots. Oh, that's true. Yes, there you are, singing in Kinky Boots. And uh, apparently you ke kept the Kinky Boots. <laughs> I have them. <laughs> I have them back now. They're not. I don't know if they're the actual original first edition kinky boots, but I have a pair of them uh, okay. now, which I lost for for a while. Now but, I'm interested in this story. Mm -hmm. How did you lose them? I took them off at a party, <laughs> and I lost them. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like a good party. <laughs> One, that you went in those boots, was, and yeah, two, you was, took them off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were uncomfortable. I took them off at a certain point, and, um, and then I was like, where are those boots? And I didn't see them for about a decade, until a friend of mine was um, moving stuff uh, out, of her, uh, out of her house and, um, and came across a box, and the boots were in them. So she called me up to say, I have the boots. She stole those boots. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not saying that. You're saying yeah. that. Yeah. She I stole mean, the boots and then yeah. ten years on went, why did I steal <laughs> those? <laughs> I'm never going to wear them. Oh, let him have them back. <laughs> and now you're delighted. Uh, I was, it was She's nice. a thief. Yeah. Um, <laughs> weirdly, uh, what are the chances of this? Uh, <laughs> Regina King, you have also played a drag queen. Gah! <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Miss Congeniality 2. Yeah. Yeah, there you are. So you are playing a Tina Turner impersonator. A Tina Turner impersonator, yes. I'm but you want to be a man playing, playing a Tina Turner. Yeah, Tina Turner. I'm a I woman see. playing a man that's... Playing, right, yeah, right, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm playing a drag queen. Going deep. Going yeah. deep. Taking a deep dive. And kind of like the Malawi thing. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> and as luck would have it, Patrick Stewart has also done drag. <laughs> How beautiful Ooh, is that? Wow. Sure. That's amazing. Wow. That's amazing. That is good. I mean, well, actually, close up is a little better from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Everyone's like, that's amazing, that's a... Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but now you have a drag name, don't you? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, um... Uh, Patty Lestew. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, that's great. Yeah. Have you ever done drag? No. Oh, no. You've never done drag. Oh, oh come on. You well, oh, You say you've never done drag. What is this? Oh, what the... What is this? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh. Right. No, let me explain. <laughs> so, whenever... It's better I'm... be good. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, wherever I am around the world gigging, <laughs> I do a bath a pick from that, like, in Norway, I wear a Viking helmet, uh, or in Canada, I wear moose antlers. And that was Copenhagen, of course, home of Chris, uh, uh, Little Mermaid. So, uh, yeah. So, I went, <laughs> wait, we went shopping for that. I thought it was a good idea. Went shopping for that. And the guy in the shop, the costume shop, recognised me. So I lost my bottle. So I said to Jane, you've got to buy it, right? So Jane went up and said, oh, I want, uh, I'm looking for a mermaid outfit. And he said, is it for you? And she went, yes, but bigger. <laughs> And then she was looking, I'm sort of like hiding, and then I was going like, okay, like that, right? And she went like, and then um, he was looking at her, and he, she paid for it, and he went, someone's going to have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and someone did. <laughs> <laughs> Ever you say uh, going to, you're going on tour again now? Yeah, um, a, a year after Humanity went on um, Netflix, I've, I've been uh, doing warm-ups, I'm still doing warm-ups, but... Um, I'm nearly ready to do uh, another world tour, and it's called um, Super Nature. So uh, I'll be rolling those gigs out, and I'll gig for about um, probably a year and a half. And what's the concept this time? The concept is called Super Nature for two reasons. I sort of debunk the supernatural. I say I don't believe in the supernatural. I think anything is, that exists is by definition part of nature and, um, you know, is explainable. And also, nature is super enough. And I say we don't need... Uh, angels and unicorns, you know, we've got the octopus. Um, <laughs> so, uh, eight legs, nine brains, three hearts and a beak. I mean, th the duck-billed platypus, right, it's a monotreme. When scientists first discovered the duck-billed platypus, they thought it was a hoax, cos it produces eggs and milk. It could make its own custard. It does... <laughs> so, it's, it's, about, it's about, you know, how amazing nature is. And, of course, human nature, I talk about human nature and... You know, my, my life, I talk about my family, always. I think they're the, the personal stories are the best when you... when You you know, when you mm -hmm. uh, illustrate a point with... And I'll give you an example. And uh, that, I, I love doing that. So it's, uh, it's sort of like a, um, you know, an hour or so stories, really. Yeah. And uh, if people don't want to leave the house, uh, they can see Ricky in his new sitcom, Afterlife, streaming on Netflix from the 8th of March. And this begins... I mean, your character Tony's at the lowest ebbs anyone can be at. It hits the ground. You see um, Tony watching um, a video diary. His wife has left him a, a secret video. And uh, she's obviously going through chemotherapy and she says, if you're watching this, I'm not around. I couldn't say this to your face, but you're lovely and, and I'm... But you're fucking useless. <laughs> so she leaves him a guide, you know, to remember to change the salt in the... Dishwasher, that's in the garage. The garage is the big thing on the side of the house. <laughs> and, you know, you see these and, um... Uh, and, basically, um, he's deep depression and he was going to commit suicide, but the dog was hungry. <laughs> so, and then that gives him long enough to think, OK, if I'm going to do this living thing, I'm going to do and say whatever I want from now, I'm going to punish the world. I'm not scared of anything, I've got nothing to lose. So he just goes out and it's like one last adventure before. And he treats it like a superpower because he thinks I'm going to do what I want and then I can always be with her. And then the other part of the show is uh, your father has uh, dementia and he's... Yeah, so it's, 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 it's got, everything's gone wrong. I had the perfect life, I love my wife, I mucked around all that, and then I've got a job I don't like, I work for a local paper with, with ridiculous stories I have to deal with. Um, and um, my dad's uh, got dementia and I have to visit him every day and I'm grumpy and the nurse hates me because I'm grumpy. Um, but I think we've got a clip where we sort of bond down the line because my dad says funny things because he doesn't know what he's saying. So, uh, and it, it's got, um, my wife is, uh, my dead wife is uh, uh, Kerry Godleyman, who was in Derek. It's got Ashley Jensen, um, David Bradley, Penelope Wilton, uh, Roisin, Connerty. It's just got the 
Yeah, it's got an amazing it, car. It's amazing, yeah. Well, uh, this is this is the clip you just mentioned. Uh, David Bradley, your dad, Ashley Jensen, the nurse. Here we go. Yeah. About your dad. You upset quite a few people today, didn't you, Ray? How? Well, he told Irene Tyndall that he would like to do her from behind. <laughs> Why from behind? Well, I don't really think that's the issue. No, sorry, I don't know. All right. And he accused Charlie Willis of sucking off Elton John. How old's Charlie Willis? 89. Oh, shit. Anything else? Please say yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he told don't... Winston Freeman that he has the cock of a Chinaman. I don't know why Chinaman's cock... <laughs> you shouldn't even say Chinaman, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It is time for music. Uh, this man has two top end albums. I'll start that again. Yeah. Yeah. Bad reading. Unbelievable. I know. How long have you been doing this? 21 <laughs> years. You don't care anymore, though, do you? No. The money just rolls in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should cut it out. <laughs> I think that people should know that I can't read. Yeah. <laughs> Rather brave, I think, to continue. Yeah. <laughs> despite, despite not being able to read. Carry on. Is it because you can't see and you won't wear glasses because you're vain? No, no, I can see that. Right. Right! <laughs> Good. So, uh, right, it's time for music. This band has two top ten albums. No, I see, I, I messed it up again. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> you're a Two top ten albums. It's hard to say. Yeah. Right, it's time for music. This man has two top ten albums and a world tour under his belt, and it's always a joy to have him sing for us. Performing Candlelight, please welcome Jack Savaretti! <laughs> Same. 
it's not the same Singing to Strangers, which is out on the 15th of March. In vinyl, it's a double album. <laughs> we went serious. No, it's we nice. Uh, now, I can't be the first person to say that that song does sound very Bondy. No, you, you're not. We keep getting that, which I'm yeah. very flattered by, but that wasn't my intention. Oh, wasn't I it? No, I was trying to go sort of Mediterranean, Inyo Morricone, but I'll take a Bond theme any day of the week. Well, no, because it sounds like an audition for a Bond theme. It really <laughs> does. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, no, it's excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. And now, uh, a little bird tells me, you are that little bird, that, uh, that you and Sir Patrick are neighbours. Yeah, you, you're aware of this, I hope. I, I am <laughs> aware of it, but I don't know any details. No, I, I, I'm about sort of three fields. It's neighbours. We live in the countryside. I live in this beautiful part of England, Oxfordshire, which I moved about three years ago. And so there's, like, fields between us rather than houses. I'd be right. Big field. Say about three huge fields. I mean, so when I say neighbours, I'm kind of glamorising the fact that I'm about a 15-minute drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking that if we have dinner at your place, all I've got to do is hike across a field to yeah, get home. I that's, guess. That's simple. Yeah, we can make that happen. <laughs> can, we, can we make a deal? Can we just connect and somehow... I would love that. Yeah, I would absolutely love that. There's not a lot that happens where we live. It's... Oh, <laughs> Trust me, there is. Trust me, there, oh, there is. is. <laughs> you trust see, it's all going on. Oh, oh, it's all this field. What's going on? Trust that field. Trust that oh, field. Don't, don't invite him. No. He's in a bowl. Jack Severity, you are going yeah. on tour. Um, and it's a big... You, you're doing a night at Wembley, the arena. Yeah, we're doing the Wembley yeah. arena, yeah. Which I'm very proud of. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, <laughs> well, well, you much deserved as well. Yeah. <laughs> when, um, when are you at Wembley arena? We're going to be at Wembley arena on the 31st of May. It's going to be the last show of our sort of European and UK tour. And it's, it's still... I sort of wake up in the middle of the night in a panic at the idea of having to, you know, put on a show at Wembley arena. But I'm very proud. I'm very proud of my band and my crew because we got there... We didn't get there the easy way, so I'm very happy and very honoured. But you got there in the end. Well, That's we the main got there thing. In the end. Uh, thank yeah. you so much, and good luck with the uh, the album and thank the tour. So uh, Jack Severetti, all of pleasure. <laughs> Beautiful. Come on. Right, uh, it's nearly it. Before we go, uh, we've got time for a visit of the ring uh, chair. Oh, Who is there? Do Hello. It again. Just do it again. <laughs> do it again. What? You just fluffed your lines again. No, no, that was a joke. No, that was you're, me garbling. I'm happy with that. That I was know. me garbling. I'm perfectly happy with that. Okay. That's do as it, good okay. as it gets. Okay. <laughs> when did you suddenly become a professional? <laughs> Not good enough. <laughs> After two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, razor yeah, sharp. Yeah. Uh, no, the poor man, look, he's gone away. Oh, oh hello. No. Oh, there he is. Oh, hello, sir. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Uh, Phil. Phil, lovely. And uh, where are you from, Phil? London. 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 And what do you do in London, Phil? Uh, I work for a charity. OK, that's always a very good one to say, cos then I don't ask you any more questions. <laughs> I just leave it. Yeah, go, OK, yeah. fair enough. Uh, off you go with your story, Phil. OK, uh, about five years ago, I was cycling in Richmond Park with my stepson, Tom, who's 17, and we cycled down this hill and up past us came cycling David and Victoria Beckham. <gasps> uh, David Beckham had his little girl on the back of his bike and we couldn't believe it. We stopped at the bottom of the hill, thought we'd better go turn around and go back up and check it was them. Sure enough, it was, and I never know what to say to people like that, and, but Tom really wanted a photo, so I said to David, I'm really, really sorry, but I know you're with your family, but can we just have a quick photo? And he was absolutely charming. Um, he took his sunglasses off, shook my hand, and had a great photo with Tom. And then at that point, I noticed there was this teenage boy circling around us on his mountain bike, staring at us. And I thought, oh, no, he's realised it's the Beckhams. And I said, oi. I said, um, can you not go and tell everyone uh, in the park that the Beckhams are here, cos you'll ruin their family day? And David turned to me and he said, uh, mate, that's my son. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a good son. Yeah, give him a walk there. Go on. 
Hey! That's a soothing voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very dead calm, yeah. You know, he's our neighbour now. You know, yeah, he lives in the neighbourhood. He lives across the other. Oh, I thought you just remembered that he was your neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we know, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, David oh, and Victoria. God. David it, and Victoria. It's becoming a celebrity oh. neighbourhood. It really oh, it is. Was 12 years ago when I'm... Buy a bike. Where do you yeah. live? <laughs> Where do you live? Where is it? Oxfordshire. Uh, oh, just West Oxfordshire. I, I did yeah. On the edge of the Cotswolds. Yeah. I lo oh, I love, I love Oxfordshire. Yeah, it's beautiful. beautiful, yeah. Come and see us. We'll... Yeah, yeah. it's all happening. <laughs> <laughs> We'll call, that's his end. call David and he'll come over as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that really is all time. We've got all we've got time for. If you'd like to have a go in the red chair yourself, it's good enough. And tell your story. You can contact us via our website at this address. Please say a huge thank you to all my guests. Jack Savaretti! <laughs> Ricky Gervais! Stuart Legemore! Regina King! Good luck! And to Patrick Stewart! Join me next week with music guests Calvin Harris and Dragon Bone Man, comic Rob Beckett, actor director Stephen Merchant, Hollywood star Army Hammer, and Oscar nominated Felicity Jones. I'll see you then. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. If you'd like to nominate someone for the unexpected star of the show or for any other surprise, please go to bbc.co.uk slash big show for all the details. Poor Miss Tiggly Tops. Ivy accidentally puts her dog down. Well, these things happen. Cuckoo follows next.